Um, lots of you haven't met me either by cyberspace or in person. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Sally and I co-founded People and Places with Harold and Kate. And my job is to work with our local partners, with the projects, with our co corporate partners, do the marketing, do the accounts, and basically keep us rocking and rolling. Kate's job is to work with the volunteers and the projects and our local partners. Harold, I'll explain in a moment. In fact, <laughs> I'll explain Harold now, if I can. Harold is really important to people and places. He's our co-founder and non-exec chair. He's a professor of responsible tourism and he works in education, advises governments, development NGOs, travel organisations, all the big travel companies that are high street names Harold works with in some way, shape or form. From hotels to cruise ships, out to small community initiatives. So Harold's an educator, a campaigner, and knows what it's like out there for real. He's the person who taught me into starting people and places. It's his fault. And if anyone wants to know the story more, he maintains that it was an idea over a large amount of wine in the Gambia and he'd forgotten in the morning and I'd remembered. <laughs> but if anyone wants to hear the story and really why we started People and Places, then please come and ask me. Um, so far this year, he's been to India, the Gambia, Spain, Myanmar twice, where he's working with Myanmar on their responsible tourism policy which we're really proud about. And he's off to Brazil immediately this evening to the Rio okay. summit. Uh, how many countries have you been to now, Harold? Sorry, I'd like to just continue. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harold's guidance is really important to people and places. And he's your man to talk to if you want to know about the challenges of responsible travel and the ethics of volunteering within this context, the politics of tourism, Harold's your man to talk to today. He actively campaigns, he's actively going to campaign this year on responsible volunteering and child protection within tourism. It's a campaign that he is highlighting this year and we're working with him on. I don't know how many of you are aware, there is a lot of talk at the moment about the exploitation of children within tourism. And thank you Harold for being here today. Diane. Diane? Yes, sorry, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Diane is our education advisor. Her knowledge, commitment, professionalism and plain hard work have been invaluable to people and places. She's just returned from Nepal and has been to Morocco, Cambodia, Thailand, India and the Gambia for us. She's also done traditional volunteer placements but Diane approached us very tentatively and said she'd like to volunteer for people and places rather than any of the projects and help us on our development, our education, particularly our education programmes. Would we even consider it? I bit her arm off. <laughs> <laughs> and with all of that, if it's not enough, she's off to South Africa and Kenya for us in September. Diane is the person to talk to um, from the, not only the education, because Diane's worked with us so much now that she, she's able to assess and work with our non-education projects as well. And you can talk to Diane about how we're trying to in, I hate this word because it's slightly quasi, but in a, the challenges of our development work, how we're trying to formalise and at least create a reporting system for ourselves where we can question ourselves as to whether we are achieving what we hope we would achieve and that we, we have a uh, a form is too strong a word, but a structure, would you agree, Diane? A structure yeah. through which we can measure our work. A structure through which we can measure our work, and that also fits in with the 
places where we're volunteering to make sure that we are doing what they want us to do and not what we think they want us to do. So Diane's work has contributed hugely to the integrity of our programme. We think we are the only volunteer organisation in the world that has the sort of independent input that we have from Diane, who is um, a qualified educator, as well as all her experience. So thank you, Diane. Nigel. Nigel. Our long-suffering newsletter ed, and also volunteer at People and Places. He wants more stories from volunteers. He gets too much of our news. So this is the man to talk to about the newsletter and whether you're not getting it and how you can contribute to it. And Nigel's also volunteered with us in South Africa and the Gambia. Um, the last, but not least, member of the People and Places team, Kate. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> those of you that know her, know her. And those of you that don't, are sure going to get to know her. <laughs> um, we had lots of notes and emails from our local partners saying they wish they could be here, as usual. Um, as the structure is that we work with local people. The People and Places team, you've seen. The people on the ground are local people in NGOs or in responsible tourism companies. They'd love to be here, but they can't be. And I was going to read out all their, hello, sorry, I'd love to be with you, and hello, Maggie, and hello, Dawn. And, but I received a letter from Michael Horton, who is our local partner in Cambodia, uh, after the um, our November roadshow. And Michael, there's a, there's a lot of talk, and Harold is the man to ask as well, or myself. There's a lot of concern at the moment, as I said, about the exploitation of children in tourism, and particularly in volunteering, orphanage tourism particularly. Um, Michael is one of the drivers of the campaign in Cambodia where there, there are some serious problems in orphanage tourism and uh, this is a campaign that Harold's working closely with Michael on and it can be replicable in other countries and we're absolutely thrilled because we're already beginning to see Nepa Nepal, Thailand and Laos talk about adopting child protection codes. We people and places have child protection codes, most organisations don't. Um, so I wanted to read you Michael's letter because I think it's quite important. And sorry, I've got to read it. I haven't learned it off by heart. After receiving the invitation to my first roadshow in November in Newport Pagnell, I began to wonder what the day would be about. A gathering of past and future volunteers, said Sally. Come to talk about Cambodia and you can answer any questions about our Cambodian projects. That proved to be a pretty good description of events. All too often we see would-be volunteers who have been led to believe from many agencies, universities, tour operators, other volunteer volu placement organisations, the media, that it is easy to volunteer and make a difference. The volunteering experience is packaged as an easy option, off-the-shelf commodity. And the underlying problems that the volunteer is supposed to be helping to solve or reduce are sanitised and simplified or conveniently ignored. In many cases, there is little rigour in the screening, selection, briefing process. Rather, the volunteer is sold the wonderful volunteer experience they will have. The focus is all on what they can get out of it instead of what they can bring. Proper preparation is vital for a successful volunteer placement. We were asked by several volunteer placement organisations to partner with them and I declined their offers as I felt they were weak in this area and too focused on providing some sort of experience for the volunteer without fully understanding the local project and community's needs. Well briefed, well placed volunteers who are sensitive to the realities of where they will work 
and who have the needs of the people they wish to help as their priority can achieve great things. Creating the conditions for this to happy, happen isn't easy and requires real commitment. Having witnessed at first hand the levels of research people and places put into the Cambodian projects to ensure they understood what their programmes were trying to achieve, why they needed volunteers and what the volunteers would be doing, I can say that I have never seen another volunteer placement organisation that takes so much care over this aspect of volunteering. Add to that the care they take preparing volunteers before they leave home and the result is a pretty impressive operation. I was very fortunate to speak with many people during the Newport Pagnell Roadshow. In amongst all the questions there were two items that people raised repeatedly. One. Those who had never volunteered before said, I'm not sure that I have any skills or that I'd be useful. Those that had volunteered said, the most important things I have learned were to have patience, to be flexible and not to have preconceived ideas about what can be achieved. That people and places attract so many volunteers who doubt their ability to make a positive contribution is a marvellous endorsement of their approach that those same people are then sufficiently well prepared to be sensitive to the situations they find themselves in speaks volumes. I look forward to welcoming volunteers in Cambodia and really hope I can be back in the UK for the next roadshow. So I thought it was important that we shared that with you. Um, those of you that are keen to fundraise for projects you've already visited and that I know some of you have been absolutely amazing, uh, there's an extremely good American magazine and website called Transitions Abroad and they have agreed that if they publish a volunteer story they will donate a hundred dollars to the project of the volunteers choice so if any of you want to know about that please ask me it doesn't it's not quite as difficult as it sounds if you read some of the stories that are published <laughs> you'll, you'll know it's really not difficult um, right nearly finished just want to explain the label system many of you we've explained it to you uh, anyone with if you look on the lists here anyone with a red name has already